Good morning, metabolomics enthusiasts, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to have this uh, first uh, talk in the uh, Biocritus uh, meeting of today. I know the company quite for some time and we have been collaborating and it's just wonderful to see how things develop both in Innsbruck as well as the science around it. So my title, Myth and Metabolites. So why is Henry Daniel qualified to talk about the gut microbiome? Now I've been studying gut function for more than 40 years. My entire career was uh, devoted to the intestine. And actually I started my career with a microbiome in my diploma project in 1978. And uh, I have a number of papers on gut microbiome, but what I also have, and that is something special, I have my own bacterium isolated from mouse intestine, Streptococcus danielli. It was uh, identified by Tom Clavel in Dirk Hallersbrook. It was given my name and I'm so pleased to have that. Okay, so let's start out. There was a very nice uh, gastroenterology paper by the Irish uh, Microbiome World by uh, Paula Toole and Fergus Shanahan. Uh, despite 60,000 papers in PubMed with a search string, human gut microbiome, the conclusion in this uh, summary here by Paula Toole was, whether a healthy microbiome can be defined is an important and seemingly simple question, but with a complex answer, in continual need of refinement. And they also described that uh, despite all the 60,000 papers and even more if we talk about animals, around 85% of the variants in the human microbiome still remains unexplained. And there was a very nice uh, paper written in Nature Reviews of Gastrology and Hepatology uh, that relates to what we quite often read these days and that is dysbiosis. So dysbiosis as a description is inexact and introduces a bias by implying an abnormality and also implies an understanding of the normal microbiome, which has not been defined. So we need to uh, define here that we don't know what is normal, we don't know what is healthy, yet we quite frequently use dysbiosis, and that is actually not scientifically correct. And, and then Fergus Shannon also says, information without perspective is a higher form of ignorance. And he refers to all these things that you read almost every day in newspapers, what you, your microbiome does to you and how you could change your microbiome by doing more, more sports activities and uh, eating better diets and so on. So let's start with the myth. The first myth is that the gut microbiome is not a new organ. Actually, uh, if you would use a search string intestinal flora, you could easily identify that in 1914, the first paper appeared on the morphology of the bacteria in the intestine. And even the idea of using probiotics to steer changes in the microbiome is almost as old with a reference uh, to a PNAS paper in 1920. It's very interesting to read. And finally, another myth is that we have 1.5 to 2 kilograms of biomass that resides in the human large intestine. And that has clearly been demonstrated quite nicely. There is much less than, than thought and quite frequently also reported. And the question is, is the gut microbiome as heavy as an elephant or as heavy as a mouse. And I just summarized these wonderful studies by Sander and Milo in Cell and also in Bloss Biology, where they come to the conclusion that all those numbers, 1.5 to 2 kilos, go back to one paper by Lucky in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, published in 1972, and cited, 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 but wrong. So the conclusion was the total mass of bacteria residing in and on humans is about 200 grams. And actually that matches quite well with old data from John Cummings lab. They took 46 sudden death victims uh, to autopsy, took out the intestine, put everything that was inside on the balance and came to the conclusion that the colonic contents were 220 grams. And when they freeze dried it, it remained, uh, there remained 36 gram of dry matter after freeze drying. So the content was largely water, 
about 180 grams. And, uh, and what this uh, picture down here shows you, that is the average amount of stool produced by volunteers from across uh, Europe. And it's on average about 100 to 120 grams. And that is, of course, the sample that is used for almost all microbiome analysis. However, that can change. And if you go to Africa, you may end up with 400 grams of stool. But other countries, for example, in uh, Scotland, you have about 50 to 60 grams of stool. And another point that is important, almost everything in the microbiome world is relative, relative abundance as shown here. So if you measure real numbers of bacteria, as shown here in this paper from the Belgium group, you can have tenfold differences, but those tenfold differences really don't show up if we express it as relative abundance. So in summary, there's much less than anticipated, and usually the microbiome world doesn't use numbers. Hmm. Let's move on. I will uh, address some of the metabolic capacities of the microbiome. Uh, and that relates to glucose homeostasis, to secondary plant metabolites, and the question, of course, what else the microbiome does and does good for us. And let's start with glucose homeostasis. This cell paper here by Xavier Adal, uh, published in 2015, hit the road, and uh, a lot of people got excited about that. It also was the foundation of a number of companies that now offer in the commercial world the uh, microbiome analysis in connection to glucose homeostasis and usually Bluetooth coupled glucose sensors. So what is the background of the observation that the microbiome in its composition has a certain quality of prediction of glycemic responses when you consume carbohydrate rich diets? And, uh, and that was nicely addressed by the PREDICT consortium led by Tim Spector at the Imperial College and this wonderful nature medicine paper here looked in thousand uh, volunteers and later in the uh, validation cohort from the US led by, uh, by Jose Ordovas in another hundred, the responses to test solutions uh, comprising either glucose or test meals in those volunteers. And what you see here is the heterogeneity in the postprandial changes in triglycerides the postprandial changes in glucose and the various parameters that affect those responses in this uh, huge variability. And you see microbiome comes down here in position four next to gender or sex in uh, respect to the heterogeneity in triglycerides and also in position four next to, the uh, to your age and other measures in uh, view of the glucose responses. The same group, and uh, that paper is uh, led by Sarah Berry, did a wonderful study, the so-called blue poo study, where they used a blue dye put into muffins. Meanwhile, that is a citizen science project where they measure gastrointestinal transit time in the volunteers. And they also looked at the microbiome, and here comes the conclusion. Gut transit and microbiome correlated in an unpredictable manner. And you also see that microbiome and gut transit correlated quite well with postprandial responses to those test solutions. Now, I'm not surprised by that because there was already quite a lot of evidence that the transit time is a key driver of the gut microbiome. And that goes back again to pretty old studies here from uh, yeah, 1987, in which it was shown that the log of the mean transit time, and transit time here was modified by uh, senna alkaloids or by loperamide, correlated well with the bacterial mass excreted by the volunteers. And you see the average bacterial mass that is excreted in stool varies between 15 and, 15 and around 30 grams. And when you play around with the transit time, you change the absolute amount of bacteria. So if you increase it, you increase uh, the bacterial count in the stool samples. And if you reduce it, you reduce the bacterial count. So not only diversity is dependent on transit time, but also the total quantity of bacteria. Yeah, we, we, that we, is not- 
And that is not surprising as it was shown here in ileostoma patients, when you use these compounds to alter transit time, you also alter the amount of carbohydrates and other compounds moving from the small intestine into the colon. So you also feed the bacteria in a different manner. And that has been simulated also in mice yeah, here by uh, example with loperamide. Uh, interestingly, the mouse transit time is extremely fast. So in contrast to humans that uh, have a transit time for the entire intestine of about two days, mice have a transit time of about two hours. The question is, is the mouse a good model? So what this picture shows you, when you play around with uh, agents that modify the transit time, you also change the composition, even in this animal model. And more important, if you use the same agents to modify the transit time, you also modify the postprandial glucose responses. So depending on whether you have a fast or a slow transit, you see the uh, deviation of, uh, of the glucose responses varies considerably from the control. And more importantly, there is a feedback, a vice versa effect as well, because the uh, concentration of glucose in blood, for example, affects the gastric emptying, but it also affects the gallbladder contraction. So that you have an interplay as well between glycemic responses and intestinal motility and overall transit time. So it just tells you that is all interwoven, that is all affecting yeah, each other's in terms of a network of metabolic responses. Now let's move on. You quite frequently read that uh, vitamins are produced by bacteria in the large intestine. And the key question is, yes, yeah, vitamins can be produced by bacteria, but are those vitamins bioavailable? And I'll show you just one experiment we did in the uh, TUM facility, the Knotobiotic facility, in which we used a biotin, vitamin biotin deficient diet. And we used that in control mice and in germ-free mice. And of course, in germ-free mice, you would not have any biotin produced by the microbiome as compared to control mice. And we used then, and that is actually a picture of the facility, uh, we used then these uh, animals to study the effect on some of the enzymes that require biotin for function, and that are the carboxylases. And I'll show you just a, a cut open uh, germ-free mouse to give you an impression that is a different animal than a control mouse. Actually, you can call a germ-free mouse a living cecum. So hmm, these mice are something special. Now we use the breakdown products of the branch chain amino acids because here you have enzymes that require biotin, the carboxylases. And what you see is when we use these biotin deficient diets, we indeed see down of these uh, yeah, enzymes here, the corresponding changes. But comparing green and blue shows you there is no much of a difference between germ-free and, uh, and conventional mice. And that tells you yeah, that the biotin produced by bacteria, if at all, has a tiny effect on the overall uh, status of the rest of the body. And finally, in a summary here, only three vitamins have been shown to be produced by the microbiome, but for humans, that does not really play an important role in defining the vitamin status. So here is a wonderful new paper. It just came out a couple of days ago. Oh, I'm sorry. It was fantastic in terms of comprehensive metabolic phenotyping of these mice with high-end machinery. You see wonderful here fecal metabolites, 88 and serum metabolites in the comparison between germ-free animals and conventional animals. Uh, what was really impressive was also what happened in brain. And uh, you see here 58 uh, metabolites were different in these two uh, uh, animal models, yet none of the neurotransmitter, ne neither serotonin or dopa or anything else showed significant differences. And people always think the bacteria in the intestine affect brain by changing the composition of neurotransmitters in brain. 
So this group has a fantastic toolkit also to assess all the neurotransmitter and the degradation products. And actually everything was found in, in the fetal samples, but not in brain. So there seems to be not too much of an alteration of uh, brain neurotransmitters mediated by gut bacteria. But when I saw what they also observed, and that is a heat map from this paper demonstrating that the germ-free mice were completely different from control mice uh, with a large number of metabolites, in particular those that showed conjugation with glucuronic acid or sulfate. I said, what in the heck did they feed here? Because I found strange metabolites here, such as the genistein, you know, glucuronide here, and equal. And I said, huh, that shouldn't be there. And then I realized they used a quick, pretty dirty diet that was based on ground wheat and soybean. And of course, these soybeans deliver phytoestrogens, genistein, and diazine. So that is not what you should feed animals when you do this high-end metabolic profiling. And that brings me to an aspect that is important in the context of human nutrition, staying with the phytoestrogens. Phytoestrogens are consumed in particular by postmenopausal women because they are claimed to have beneficial effects by activating estrogen receptor alpha or beta and protecting the cardiovascular system. Now, what is important in this context is if you study humans, you see this enormous difference in the metabolic capacity of the microbiome in terms of producing from diazine and genistein in the soy phytoestrogens, either equal, and equal is considered to be the active compound that delivers the protection as compared to the uh, degradation products that you could classify as uh, causing a bioinactivation. So you have equal producers and you have non-producers. And in humans, about 30% are equal producers and the rest doesn't produce equal as bioactive compound. And that is a nice study by Sabine Culling from Karlsruhe showing, six, showing you in 60 volunteers the pattern of the different metabolites found in urine that are derived from the different metabolic activity of the gut microbiota. And they also did the same thing in animals and compared the men and women and uh, red female and males. And that is shown here. So only 1% of the compound delivered via the oral route pops up in plasma unchanged and the rest are all kinds of metabolites. But what the picture shows you is that all those metabolites produced by the microbiome are completely different in rats and are completely different in mice. And of course, half of the scientific literature uh, found in PubMed on the phytoestrogens is animal studies. And I said, you know, be careful. Animals produce completely different metabolites. And some of them have biological activities, other not. But at least mice and rats all produce equal, whereas in humans, you only have this uh, low equal production. Now, we also talk about the cardiovascular system today, and trimethylamine has been coming up as a risk factor independent of various other risk factors. TMA is produced by the gut microbiome and it was associated with the myocardial infarction or stroke or death. And you see as higher the levels of plasma TMA and TMAO were, as higher was the uh, incidence of these diseases. And uh, funny enough, the highest level that you can consume of this trimethyl amine oxide that is usually produced in my liver from the TMA produced in the intestine is with sea fish, which uh, is considered to deliver omega-3 fatty acids as a protective agent. But it also has the highest level of TMAO because that is an osmolite in fish. So funny enough, there is uh, a lot of uh, epidemiological evidence that TMAO level correlate with this in disease incidences for the cardiovascular system. However, when you do Mendelian randomization, all those effects are done. And that led to the conclusion in recent years that TMAO is more a marker molecule and has no causal effect on the cardiovascular system. Yeah, it seems to be increased in plasma if you have a slight impairment of glomerular filtration. 
So finally, a bit to the nitrogen in the intestine. And that has been an interest of me for a long, long, long time. And, uh, and it starts with the question of whether essential amino acids, such as lysine or treonine or branching, can be produced by the gut microbiome. You quite frequently read that because the bacteria in the gut can produce these essential amino acids, no doubt. And that was shown in early days by using stable isotope labeled ammonium chloride or stable isotope labeled nitrogen urea fed to humans and to animals. And it was shown that all the amino acids in the intestine were finally labeled. That means the bacteria produced all those amino acids, including the essential amino acids, because in plasma you could find the labeled lysine, the labeled treonine. So no doubt there is some of these amino acids produced that enter circulation. However, in nice studies in animals and pigs, when they infused label lysine into the colon, they only found about 1% of the tracer finally incorporated into the proteins of the muscle. So essentially the same as before, yes, there is some, but not very much of those essential compounds produced in the intestine and bioavailable to the rest of the body. And that is a very nice study that looked at the balance across the intestine, including then the microbiome, looking at various metabolites. And you see with all these bars going down here, these are the compounds that are absorbed in the colon. And you see, of course, the short chain fatty acids here, but you also see there is an absorption of etanolamine, for example, from the small intestine. Now, this study has been looking also at other metabolites to answer the question, what really is extracted in colon and comes into systemic circulation? But you should keep in mind, even if you don't eat and even if you don't bring protein into your GI tract by diet, you have an endogenous turnover in large quantities of nitrogen compounds with about 50 grams of, of protein entering the gut by all the uh, yeah, secretions, even in the absence of dietary intake. And that brings me actually back to my beginning of my scientific career, where I studied the role of urea in shaping microbiome in early days, which meant you couldn't sequence and you couldn't culture. It was a shot into the dark using high concentrations of antibiotics to bring down the gut microbiome called flora at that time, and to look what that means in terms of the nitrogen handling in the body. So what you see is here, a large quantity of urea is produced yeah, from your protein intake. That accounts about 200 millimoles per day. And about uh, a quarter up to a half of this urea produced by a liver with a high demand for energy because each molecule needs three ATP for production. Large quantities of urea are passing down the intestine and reach the colon and are cleaved by bacteria that express urease to release ammonia and bicarbonate. And the ammonia is largely reabsorbed brought back by portal system into the liver and urea is synthesized again. So you have an enormous turnaround of urea and ammonia. And ammonia levels in portal vein are four to five times higher than in peripheral blood. So that is an important mechanism to keep a constant flow of nitrogen around. And the bacteria in particular, the um, bifidobacteria are known to express, most of them express urease activity. And that means they can create a microclimate around themselves that makes them independent of any pH changes in the microbiome. And moreover, this capacity to utilize the urea produced by liver is also important for selecting the microbiome. And that has been shown in this Nature, Nature Microbiology paper here of December 2018, in which these bacteria as compared these, uh, to these others showed a much higher enrichment of N15 uptake by urease activity, both from secreted nitrogen as well as from dietary nitrogen. 
So this nitrogen circling and the intestine and the uh, systemic circulation, this exchange also contributes to microbiome diversity. Let me summarize here. Gut microbiome research lacks in almost all study very, very basic phenotypic measures, such as frequency, volume, and appearance of stool. And that are all known factors who have major effects on diversity and amount of bacteria in stool. And I'm almost sure that Dirk later this afternoon will come back to that. The gastrointestinal transit time is one of the most relevant determinants of the microbiome. The contribution of the microbiome derived metabolites such as essential vitamins or essential amino acids to body demands is small or even irrelevant. Now, finally concluded. The metabolic capacities of the microbiome are highly variable and that is a really critical aspect in all the dietary studies conducted that produce so heterogeneous uh, effects and that needs much, much more careful studies. And lastly, there's a huge flux of endogenous substrates, as I showed you, protein as well as nitrogen from urea that goes into the intestine and that comes back and that also shapes the diversity of the gut microbiome. So finally, metabolomics is fantastic and metabolomics has already added quite a lot of understanding to the microbiome and this interplay of our environment with the microbiome. And I hope I live long enough to learn more that uh, so far has not been on my radar screen. Thank you very much. Thank you.